welcome to In Search of the Crystal Skull, an epic adventure into the world of mediocrity. My name is Aaron. My name is Patricia. And today we are going to be continuing our adventure through the Land of the Hidden Gems, and today we are going to be looking at a Weird Al Yankovic movie of all things. Well, yeah, it, the only one he's ever done uh, that he wrote and that he uh, stars in, and I think he also um, did some of the the decisions on who was going to be in the cast. But yeah, I mean, this is the only one he has ever written that he has ever starred in. And um, that this should be really interesting to talk about. Yeah. So UHF is a 1989 American comedy starring Weird Al Yankovic, David Bowe, Fran Dresner, Victoria Jackson, Kevin McCarthy, Michael Richards, uh, Jenny Wannabe, uh, Billy Barty, Anthony Geary, and so forth and so forth. So many people star in this movie. That's one thing I think that we should probably do comments on. It's insanely big cast. You know, yes, for it what is. is basically a very small movie. Its budget was only $5 million. Mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah, like... it, was, it was a very small budget movie. Mm -hmm. So, um, Orion Pictures were involved in the distribution. So, it stars uh, uh, Weird Al Yankovic as uh, George Newman, a shiftless dreamer who stumbles into the managing a low budget television station and surprisingly finds success with uh, his, his, with uh, uh, ecstatic programming choices, uh, spearheaded by the antics of a janitor turned children's television host. So, um, I mean, before we get too much into the. Um, uh, the plot here. I think uh, um, the idea of this guy just somehow just landing this job of uh, being in charge of a television station is like you know like uh, he's pretty much landed the ultimate dream at this point. I think at least for you and I. I mean, how 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 ecstatic would we be if we had, if we had our own television or radio station? You know. Exactly. Yeah, and not only that, but a radio station that just so happens to be the worst radio station in the entire town. Like nobody's listening to it because it just plays nothing but reruns of uh, classic sitcoms from the '60s, or and you know, I guess maybe if it was radio's case, then um, maybe like those old time radio shows that they would play back in the '30s and '40s. You know, back well, then. Well, now that you put it that way, that would kind of suck, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, we're gonna have reruns runs of like old these old shows that pretty much nobody cares about anymore and that's the only thing that's just keeping it by while everybody else is just exceeding us i mean we're just like a tiny blip compared to everybody else but yeah so essentially uhf uh, the idea of this came from the fact that um weird al yankovic he was getting really popular with his music as we know he's been uh parodying various popular songs over the past 30 40 years uh at the time he would have been known for his michael jackson song bad or the madonna song uh um like a virgin where he instead of like like a surgeon but yeah it was around that time when he and alongside with his manager at the time jay Levy, who would eventually become the director of the movie, uh, they were coming up with some ideas for some uh, a story that Weird Al Yankovic would be a part of, where it's basically a parody of movies that is based off of real people, such as The Secret Life of Walter Mitty and various others. So uh, he wrote the script and he decided to um, basically have it like this weird amalgamation of all of these strange things that you would see on a television station but at the same time uh something that would really connect to his crowd of people uh, who um you know were like really into his music at the time this was back before he became the pipe culture i pop culture icon that he's known of today he he had a bit of a cult following uh you know starting off with being featured in dr demento's radio show and then spinning off into doing his own stuff yeah, what's amazing about us picking this movie is that we didn't intentionally actually want to uh, to do this one, but uh, unfortunately, I think uh, I don't remember what the reason was for uh, like uh, swapping out one of our other movies. But uh, well, the reason why was because we were originally going to be talking about Chaplin, starring Robert Downey Jr. And when we first saw the ratings, it was sixty percent on Rotten Tomatoes, but it changed over to fifty nine percent. So we had to change it for another film. That's why. Oh, we decided. okay, then that's the reason why we did it. But uh, anyway, I'm pretty glad that we did because uh, UHF so right you know in regards to like this being uh, one of the hidden gems it definitely is because uh, you know this idea of this janitor just becoming like uh, an overnight sensation and like uh, just relating to everybody and then all of a sudden you know uh, George Newman just and uh, you know his, uh, his friend just finally find the one thing that's going to basically bring their television station back you know it's like it's just it's, uh, it's it is quite a funny thing on top of that as well um, it also has kind of like they must have borrowed this from Robocop 
I think that's the only thing I can mm. think of that they did was, but uh, they put in like a hilarious advert for like different things as uh, as, as they go along. So uh, there's obviously you know the uh, really uh, r- really strange guy who like uh, sells all the cars, and then there's uh, uh, Conan the Librarian. Is uh, yeah, is, uh, that is my favorite advert out of the lot. <laughs> I love Conan the <laughs> Librarian, and so there's that. But uh, you know, in between all of that, like uh, there's also like all the plots going on. So you got the uh, you got the crazy scientist who, uh, by the way, we won't give spoilers away about what uh, his backstory and everything like that. But he seems to be the technical guy around the radio station who seems to be doing like other things as well, and uh, he's quite a quite a bizarre fellow uh, in that. And, yeah, uh, which um, we actually were looking at this role, and it's like, and we were saying to ourselves. Maybe Man, Christopher Lloyd would be perfect in this. And apparently, Weird Al Yankovic thought the same thing. They were originally going to have Christopher Lloyd perform as this character. No but... way. No, I'm serious. It's true. Because uh, he was in a movie called Taxi, and they thought that this role would be perfect for him. But uh, they decided to instead give it to the person that was uh, eventually played him in the movie. So... Yeah, that's actually interesting about we almost could have had Christopher that's Lloyd play this. such a weird design. thing, like, you know, because, you know, a couple of years later, he'd do Hey Arnold the Movie, which I thought was kind of a weird choice for him, but, uh, you know, like, uh, the fact, I mean, he basically... So, um, Hey Arnold the Movie was okay, but UHF is... Maybe it's because it's a, a small film from Orion, I don't know, but, uh, yeah, just it's like... Uh, yeah, I'm pos- really surprised possibly. He tur- I'm really surprised he turned that down. I thought that would be pretty good for him. No, 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 no. He didn't turn it down. He was going to reach out to him to play the role, but he decided to keep the guy that he had uh, originally to oh, play as the character. Oh, okay. Then. So, who knows? Maybe he might have done it. Like, uh, Yeah, that- maybe. Mm. Yeah, but there was a lot. There were a lot of people who were originally supposed to be in this movie, but for some reason or another, just uh, didn't happen. Like... Um, for example, uh, Philo, uh, one of the characters in the movie, was uh, in, you know was originally going to be played by Joel Hodgson from Mystery Science Theater Three Thousand. Oh, that would have been fun. Yeah, that would have been a lot of fun. Yeah. But um, you know, he was uh, instead played by Anthony Geary, and uh, you guys probably know him for uh, such movies such as Go- Johnny Got His Gun and Fish Tank and various others. And you may probably know him for his re- his role as uh, Luke Spencer in General Hospital. Um, yeah, and uh, then we have, like, uh, various other people. Good grief, uh, I'm, just like... re- I'm just reading here, and uh, you have to forgive us, everybody. We're just kind of, I'm just discovering stuff as we go along, but it's apparently Jennifer Tilly and Ellen DeGeneres auditioned for this movie. Yes, they did. Uh, they were, I think they were going to play as the girlfriend of um, George, but then that ended up going over to Victoria Jackson instead. Wow. Like it, but, uh... Which, um, you know, I think it might, I- I'm just going to probably say this as a, not, not too much of a spoiler, but I kind of wish that they did because um, the character that Victoria Jackson played as, she was probably my least favorite in the movie. Yeah. Not, I mean, Terry is not a very good girlfriend. I mean, I can understand that she would be really upset for George, like that, you know, with the fact that he stood her up when, you know, her and her parents were on the date and they were going to promise that they were going to meet up with each other and she was upset that he never showed up. I can understand that. But then you have this creepy moment where George is like begging Terry to come back with filling her house of flowers and just saying, please take me back. And she's like, no, until like the very end of the movie. And also, I'm just going to say Victoria Jackson's portrayal in this movie is was kind of bland compared to everybody else in this movie who's playing this so over the top. It's hilarious. She just sticks out like a sore thumb. I don't know. I mean, like, we're talking about Ellen DeGeneres back in the day. I mean, we're not, we're not talking about, like, when she finally, when she got to be Dory. In, uh, in, That's in, true. In, I mean, this was like you know her stand-up years. Not b- this was before she was in the Ellen TV show. This was before she was in her sitcom. This was before she would voice as Dory from Finding Nemo. Yeah, before, so before she, she took, before she took that selfie with George W. Bush and all those horrendous allegations about her show <laughs> came out. Mm, yeah. <laughs> all before Very that. True. Very yeah. Long times. before that. But, uh, but still, yeah. I mean, like anybody else could have played as this character. Anybody. Mm-hmm. And so, um, one thing, I, it's, one character I find very interesting in all of this is is George Newman himself. You know, like the fact that he's so he feels so imaginative, but at the same time, like he can become very he can be very distraught with the situation. Like uh, you know, he just becomes uh, despondent with like uh, you know, and just uh, unhappy with uh, how things are going. You know, definitely when he's like he's got the station, but then realizes it's going to go under. So you see him like uh, the next morning, and like he does like the whole kids show, and like uh, he just uh, you can just tell he just hates every moment. 
of it now because obviously he can't do anything with it with it at the moment. So he ends up kind of like just giving the job to the janitor. He just stops caring, and that's probably like the best move he probably ever did for the station. At yeah, that point. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and and the, and the fact that it's the the janitor is played by Kramer. That's what's just so hilarious to me that you have Michael Richards, aka Kramer from Seinfeld, playing as this really dopey character, which is just absolutely hilarious. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, like, uh, was this before he did Seinfeld, or was this uh, was this after? Well, he did Seinfeld Seinfeld came out around the same time, so I don't know if it came out before or after the movie's premiere. I'm just going to double check. So, yeah, Seinfeld 1989. Premiered... Yeah, Richard was cast yeah. as uh, Cosmo Kramer in NBC Television. I'm just reading. It yeah. Out so the, okay, so Seinfeld came out in July 5th. And UHF came out in July 21st. So, wow, like a few weeks ahead of each other. Although, technically, I think that he was working on UHF first because usually, you know, it takes about a year for video production. So, yeah, um, I, kind of funny that, you know, um, his career would have picked up around the same time where he was doing both UHF and Seinfeld. Although, I, I think a lot of people know him more for Seinfeld than UHF. Mm hmm. So uh, then we're introduced to our basically our, our main enemy of the movie, which is Channel Eight, who's basically been like the dominant television station in the in the region for uh, the uh, the pretty much just uh, as knowledge can go far. And so uh, he, George Moon decides to go check out the competition, and it's pretty much uh, I don't know, like uh, given that it's 1989, I mean, like this type of villain. I mean, I guess I mean how I mean how 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 um uh how often did we see this type of villain? I think Pretty much all the time. time. I mean, the yeah. the over the top bureaucratic villain who would just be caring about money and views and stuff like that. I mean, this was pretty common back in the day. Except that it's just so over the top. Like he would do anything in order for him to stay as the number one station in this in this tiny little town. Uh, I mean, he would go to the point in which, like, all of his people are just nothing but pawns to him. Like, he just dismisses them all together. And, you know, his his he treats his sons really horribly. It's just, I mean, he even fires one guy for having an idea, and then they use it anyway, even long after the guy's been fired. So this guy is just... He's yeah. evil, but at the same time, I don't time, know. He's just like, you know, back in the eighties, I mean, like uh, they were more. I mean, I get this is the uh, the latter stages of the eighties, but you know, when I think of eighties villains, I think of like you know Judge Doom from uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, you know, like uh, Pinhead from Hellraiser, you know, the Predator from Predator, you know, kind of like uh, they're like oh, you know, they are kind of like you know more terrifying, more animated kind of like villains, if you will, and uh, you know, even got Jet Torrance in The Shining. You know, kind of I, like I guess I was I guess I was kind of going more for a, a Gordon Gecko kind of situation from Wall Street in which you know you have this really stingy really corrupted businessman so I was thinking more of like that except that he's played like way high in the over the top meter mm -hmm. not more of a judge doom kind of situation I guess you know and uh, I mean like uh, there's also uh, Thulsa doom from Conan Conan the barbarian <laughs> instead of Conan the barbarian <laughs> What, yeah, what would yeah, he yeah. be in Conan the Librarian? The guy who like, turns all the books in late and like uh, <laughs> encourages like all his followers to do the same thing. I don't know. But uh, yeah. Anyway, um, so um, obviously we introduce our villain, and uh, he is quite he is quite stock. I will admit that. And so like, yeah, he uh, is. but uh, I mean, we guess we're introduced to like uh, maybe uh, another. Uh, can you really call him an antagonist at this point? I mean, like, uh, there's Big Louie, who like uh, obviously does all like all the b the bookings and like all the uh, the bets and everything like that for like uh, obviously yeah. the, uh, our uh, our uncle who uh, uh, basically uh, finances the television station and obviously hands it over to George. He ends up into like a seventy five thousand thousand dollars worth of debts which is uh, quite significant in this uh we, we rounded it up to like what was it one hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something yes. like that in today's money so yeah so obviously there's a, a big threat in that regard so then they're thrown into the situation where um you know the, the uncle will end up selling the television station over to channel eight which obviously you know george doesn't want to lose the station after now finding success with it so they go on like this massive media drive in order to um save the station and so obviously we get this whole and you know like uh, this is um it kind of reminds me of like uh, I mean obviously they, they 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 have been like these things in movies where oh we've got to get this money all really quick and then we get to like the very end of the movie and then we, they finally like you know hooray they finally do it in the end 
and things like that. But we, we so, saw this with Avenue Q. We saw this with the Muppets. Um, there's yeah. a lot of other examples. Yeah, so, but Avenue yeah, Q and the Muppets came a lot later on after that. I mean, like, uh, sure. I'm trying to think of other movies during that time that kind of did that kind of thing. I'm trying to really think about that, really. Yeah, so, I, I can see where you're. Yeah. I can see what you're so right, yeah. I mean, like, uh, I guess you could say it's a pretty novel way to like build uh, build up tension. I think, uh, going towards uh, the end of the movie. And also, on top of that as well, like, uh, I would say that... It's a wonderful life. I can think of it's a wonderful life. Oh, yeah, there's a wonderful life as well, yeah. Yeah, remember when uh, they decided to raise the money for George because he lost the money to the bank that he was supposed to give over to Mr. Potter, and so they decide to, um, you know, raise the money for him so that he can be able to pay off all his debts? Uh Uh-huh. So, um, yeah, so these types of things have been done before, but I think this, in this instance, I think it's, uh, I think it's pretty, uh, it's pretty good. So, um, so, the Channel 8 realizes that they're going to meet the goal. So instead, they decided to kidnap the janitor to uh, obviously to uh, um, start stop him from like raising the money, and obviously he's relying on like all the other people to do. Mind you, the one thing I really like about this is that um, it really does feel like you feel like the spirit of like uh, community radio and community television in this, don't you? Like, you know, like, yeah, uh, which, which is something you don't see very often. Yeah, like, I like, this is what I like about Channel 62, is like, they, they decide, oh, hey, well, hang on a second, we've just got this uh, janitor who has just basically, uh, you know, just been himself, and everybody loves him, and I mean, what if we get other people involved in this TV station? So then you get to see, like, you know, the karate guy come in, and then you get to see, like, uh, the guy who, like, has all the exotic animals in his house. And things like that is like. Well, I, mean, uh, we, I guess we need. To, I guess we do need to talk about that. So uh, Trinidad Silva, who plays as the uh, guy who um, has the crazy animals in his house, uh, Raúl the bizarre animal lover. Sadly, he passed away due to a car accident during the making of the film, and so they um, the movie is uh, in. Uh, you know, the movie is dedicated to his honor. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, because uh, he does that, he actually do have some really hilarious things. And some of that's why it's really sad that he passed away. Because go, you know, what what would he have moved on to do? Like, uh, if I he could do know. that, if you do that hilariously, imagine what else he could do. You know, it's an, know. it's another one of those one ifs in cinema. You know, mm-hmm. so. Uh, but uh, I mean, um, so uh, the one thing that I, I really find quite ama- quite amazing is that because you know, Weird Al Yankovic was pretty big at that time, and uh, you know, it also was only a small budget to make this movie, and it is a pretty hilarious movie. But uh, surprisingly, it only made about six point one million dollars at the box office. Yeah, well, well there's a reason why. You see, oh, was there a pandemic then too? <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, not that I know of. But no, the reason why is because just like with a lot of cases in which um, that we've been talking about throughout this retrospective, that the movie came out at the wrong time when there was a lot of movies that were competing against that at the same time. So the, around the time that this movie came out, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Ghostbusters 2, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Lethal Weapon 2, Batman, License to Kill, When Harry Met Sally, and Weekend and Bernie's were all out in the movie. Oh, that's, that is, yeah, um, no. I mean, who, whoever decided to say, oh, hey, let's release it that time, made absolutely the wrong call. Yep. Oh, good grief. Most of those movies that we've just, ri- just listed there are classics now. Yes. Good grief. Like, you know, Honey, They Shrunk the Kids. I know I know a lot of people who love that movie. Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade, you know, need I say more. Ghostbusters 2, okay. It's not as good as the original one, but still, people still like it. And License to Kill. And Batman. Oh, and Weekend at Bernie's as well. Yeah, and, and When Harry Met Sally. Yeah. And Harry Met Sally. Weapon. And Lethal Weapon 2. And so, Lethal yeah, Weapon 2. Oh, so, yeah, good just, just like the case, just like the case with, um... You know, uh, Rescuers Down Under, uh, you know, where it came out when, you know, Crocodile Dundee and, you know, those kind of films were out of style. And also with Matilda that we talked about in the Royal Jaw Retrospective, where it came out during a time in which there were a lot of other movies that people wanted to watch. And then The Rocketeer, where it came out when they were trying to find the next Indiana Jones and... Um, you know, there was a lot of competition of movies that came out around that time as well. So yeah, it just it just so happened to come out at the wrong time when there were just so many amazing other movies that were out there. Yeah, and uh, do you know like, the sad thing about this as well? Like, uh, where did Yankovic basically went, went on a massive slump until basically he was able to write, write "Smells Like Nirvana" for his Off the Deep End album? Exactly. Yeah. So this movie put him on a two-year career slump where he did absolutely nothing because he was just so devastated that his movie didn't do as well in the box office. Oh, and man. and not to mention that this movie was out of print when it came out on VHS because nobody bought it. 
But then over the years, because it was out of print and very few people had it, it became a cult classic to the point in which people were like bootlegging the movie and watching it in like midnight screenings. And so uh, over time, when the movie was released on DVD, they made this huge promotional push and then everybody started watching it and knew about it. I mean, remember that around the 80s, Weird Al Yankovic was pretty well known, but he was still like a cult icon. He wouldn't become like the massive pop culture icon that we would know of him today. So, and you know, even like reviewers and critics, they always use the clips of UHF, probably not even know that it came from UHF to like, you know, point out something really stupid. Like, you know, it's like, hey, um, uh, you know, what did this scene have anything to do with this movie? And then they'll be like, nothing, absolutely nothing. nothing. And stupid, you're so stupid. I mean, I mean, I'm sure that there are people who've actually watched the film before they did, you know, put in those references, or they just put in the references because they thought it was funny. Well, I mean, likelihood is, I mean, uh, film critics and people like within the film communities would have known of UHF because obviously they would have had to review it. So, I mean, like, uh, it has got lots of reviews. Would you believe? Like, it's 64 yeah. percent Rotten Tomatoes, so people have seen yeah. it. So. Exactly, and you know, so far this is the this is uh, one that has a lot of mixed reviews. Like Siskel and Ebert didn't like this movie. Well, if you can believe it, I mean, like, uh, keep in mind, like, this is at the time when they were basically saying, like, uh, I'm trying to think, they were reviewing other. I was actually watching clips of their show, and they were like reviewing other movies that they were saying, oh, were good at the time, but then now there's basically the lampoon since then. Space Jam was one that I remember. Mm -hmm. They they said that was a really good movie, which is like everyone was saying, no, it wasn't. <laughs> so it's like it's, uh, it's like okay. I mean, yeah, people like it, but was was it a good movie? I mean, like I'd walk on that one. I mean, I yeah. So this that. is what they said about the movie. So Gene Siskel said, "Never has a comedy tried so hard and failed so often to be funny," and he gave it a zero rating. Oh, jeez. And Roger Ebert said, this is the dreariest comedy in many a month, a depressing slog through recycled comic formulas. And he gave it a one out of four. That was like, what, what, and uh, what, the, uh, well, I know I know both of them aren't alive today, but uh, good grief. I mean, like, the amount of comedies now, they're probably even worse than UHF. Yes, they're much worse, especially if uh, Seltzer and Freeberg are involved in it. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, it's just, it's, uh, I mean, UHF is, I, I laughed my head off. I'm really sad that I never got a chance to watch it sooner. You know, Me like, neither. I, I love never... this movie. <laughs> Yeah, this this you know what this is probably my favorite one that we've seen in this uh, in this uh, series and uh, in search of the crystal skull. This is one of the best movies that we've seen throughout this um, series so far, and I, I'm surprised that most people haven't really talked too much about it. Exactly. I mean, obviously within the uh, within the circle, people talk about it all the time. Obviously, you mentioned those jokes, but uh, sure. I mean, like, um, and also, by the way, just because back in the day it didn't get any love now, it didn't get any love then, doesn't mean it's not getting love now. I mean, uh, back. In like uh, 2014, Shell Factory still have like the uh, the anniversary edition still available. So right, yes, and you know there there have been many cases that we can talk about where movies flopped in the box office and became cult classics. So I mean that's not to be surprised that this movie also went through similar situations mm -hmm. and. Um, not to mention that, uh, you know, we've had a lot of people who've, you know, not only referenced it, but due to the movie quotes, but binging with Babish made the Twinkie Wiener sandwich on his YouTube channel and it gained 2 million views on his, on his YouTube channel. Yeah. So like, uh, in regards to like uh, the legacy that this leaves, it leaves a really good legacy. A lot of people still use its jokes. I mean, uh, people are still, you know, people are now making YouTube videos of like some of the stuff they do in the movie. I mean, like yep. uh, it's uh, pe people uh, will reference it as well. Like, you know, so uh, look at Weird Al Yankovic. Yes, he went for a slump uh, later on, but uh, then when he basically went on his massive comeback and he went to the point where he was able to do like, you know, the signature theme for Captain Underpants, the, uh, you know, the first movie. You know, like, yeah, I mean, you know, around the 90s, this is when he started to really start picking himself up again after the slump. Uh, you know, uh, just what you mentioned before, you know, uh, smells like um, the, the the smells, smells like, like spirit. Yeah, smells like Nirvana, uh, Amish Paradise. Um, uh, let's see, what was it? Um uh, Alapalooza, various other things that he was releasing. And then around the late 90s, that's when he had his uh, TV series that tried to be like the next Pee Wee's Playhouse, and that lasted for 13 episodes. And that also has a huge cult following as well. And then around the 2000s, he was also known for many others. Uh, You're Pitiful, White and Nerdy, 
um, and then, uh, you know, various others. And then eventually he would go into the voiceover work. And this is when his stuff became massively huge, when he was in My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. And then he became the lead uh, voice in um, uh, Milo's Murphy Law. So, yeah, I mean, many people knew about him you know, today, but as for like 30 years ago, I'm sure that he had a strong cult following because of his music, but yeah, it was still, he was still had a smaller audience, but yeah, but this movie, I mean, it's like right up there with Airplane as one of the best comedic spoofs I've ever seen. Yeah. And also like, he's, you know, Weird Al is still relevant today. I mean, obviously we referenced him doing like music for movies and everything like that, but I mean, he recently, I mean, two years ago, he appeared on, uh, on uh, Game Grumps. He uh, did, um, uh, he played Wheel of Fortune and also played uh, My Mom Hit My Game. Uh, with them, <laughs> you know, like, uh, cool. so, I mean, like, so, you know, today he's still, he's still making appearances and, uh, you know, he still seems to love it. So, uh. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've not seen a lot of My Little Pony, but I did see that episode where he was in the show as, Ch- as Cheese Sandwich going up against Pinkie Pie to who would throw the birthday party. It is so good. Well, it's, <laughs> it's weird, really Al, good. yeah. Like, you know, here's the thing about this. I really hope, I mean, like, I, you know, I really hope that one day he gets his own animated movie. Like I would that love would to see him so like good. just just lampooning like all the 3D movies of like how inspiring Pixar is and like uh, you know how uh, mediocre Illumination Studios is like uh, I'd love to see like a, a like a UHF esque kind of movie about 3D animated films but from him that would be so hilarious oh, like man. maybe maybe they're like the 2D animated studio because nobody's taking 2D animated films seriously anymore and he's like you know only has like a handful of people who have this passion for doing movies and they only have a very very small budget and they can do everything everything with just the old-fashioned way and it takes a long time to do it but then it looks really really weird but everybody loves it because it's so weird and it's so unique and so different yeah. it, it, it'll be like you know what if we take adventure time and mix it with weird al and put in a lot of music and put in this really crazy animation like in uhf there's this um music video that's akin to like mtv with the stop motion and the cgi and it looks really really good and it's it's hilarious so, i don't know if this would yeah. be a tasteless or not for a joke in the movie but uh, i probably imagine that uh, he, he's like okay well uh, we've got all the like it's what do we need next he's like well this is gonna this whole thing you want to do is gonna take like uh, like hundreds of an- like like uh, you know loads of animators to kind of like you know write every single thing and everything like that do a hand drawn and stuff like that and it's like a oh, good grief what are we gonna do so like there is on the like on the north korean border trying to like smuggle like you know north korean animators like over over the border just kind of get animate their movie oh like, my god that reminds me so much of that simpsons uh joke in which when they find out who's the one making the simpsons merchandise and it's a bunch of chinese kids who are working in oh, that's sweatshops the bank, that, that's the banksy uh um intro- couch gag Oh, that yeah. okay. Like the couch gag, yeah, it's that, that thing. So, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it would be like that thing. Oh, jeez. Like, like, oh maybe, I don't know how tasteless that would be, but so hey, it would fit. But uh, so, um, I mean, I guess we've got to rate this movie uh, because we kind of talked. I mean, I, I first of all, I got to say, like, uh, um, I really thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I think it's funny. I think uh, all the actors and actresses are really good in this movie, but you know, obviously, the girlfriend is a bit is a bit bland, but you know, I still think they all make it work and. Uh, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I think this is the first time on In Search of the Crystal Skull. I'm going to say nine. You know? Me too. I am going to say nine as well because this was the biggest surprise for me personally because, I mean, I thought, okay, you know, we have a movie based off of like a cult character. I thought it would be like something like Ernest or Pee Wee Herman or, um, you know, uh, maybe, you know, lesser extent Fred Figglehorn in which like, okay, the movie, you know, it, it's good for the fans of their products. But no, like anybody could watch this and enjoy themselves. Like personally for me, if you're even if you're not a weird Al Yankovic fan, if you're into comedy, then you need to watch this movie because it is just that hilarious. There's a lot of like crazy jokes, there's a lot of pop culture references, there's a lot of spoofs. Um, it, it does have this really triumphant story about the underdog getting to the top. So yeah, this movie is just awesome. And it's kind of sad because I think this is the lowest ranked movie that we talked about in this retrospective because even the Disney animated sequels that we talked about had better scores than this. Yeah, well, like it's Disney, isn't it? So I think it's. I think just the name alone. I mean, unless you're talking about like Cars Two, or if you're talking about like something really terrible that Disney should never have released. 
I mean, like, well, uh, I'm, 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 I'm referring to like the directed video movies that we talked about, such as uh, uh, Timon and Pum, uh, yeah, no, Lion King One, one and, and a Half, half. and, uh, Cin well, and uh, Cinderella to be, Three. To be fair, li I liked one, Lion King One and a Half. Like, I think it did no, deserve its rating. Too. And uh, also, sure, sure. C Cinderella Three should have been Cinderella Two. Like, uh, you know, mm -hmm. at least on the third bounce they got it right, which is a very rare. This is a very rare thing to pull off. Like, after you've had a really bad second movie, like, how on earth do you justify doing a third movie unless you do something really dramatic with it, like they did with Cinderella? Cinderella 3. Exactly, exactly. So, yes, uh, th this movie was just awesome. And you can watch it for free on Tubi TV. So you can check this out and just oh, I know that we're not giving too much into plots and a lot of the jokes and all that kind of stuff and, and so many of the, the actors who are in this film, like, you really need to see this for yourself in order for you to jo enjoy this because... I mean, this is like definitely one of the best comedies out there. I well, mean, I would the, also given the fact that it's also out for free, we'll put the link in the description as well. So. Yes, we will. We will put the link in the description. So I think that uh, you know, with a lot of people saying that it's a mad, 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 mad world is like one of the definitive cl classics in comedy. Which, sure, you know, in some parts it is, but this movie I think is even better because of just how over the top and hilarious and just weird it can get i mean it takes no apologies of how weird it is it just it just takes that kind of risk to showcase that yeah you know we know it's weird we know not a lot of people are going to get it but we're going to do it anyway and but, they but pull again, it if, off you, if, you, if you're a massive fan of weird like yankovic this movie is for you like go watch it you know yes and even if you're not a weird fan, even if, if you're not a fan of Weird Al Yankovic, I mean, I would say still watch it anyway. I mean, I, I get it that it's going to be not to everybody's taste. Like, they're going to think that, oh, you know, they're just, you know, doing all these spoofs and it's just weird humor for the sake of weird humor. I get it for some people, but... I think it's fantastic. I, I really recommend that you guys watch it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I just uh, they used to say, uh, like, uh, what, there was kind of one of the reasons why I ended up kind of falling into, uh, it kind of reminded me of why um, I ended up in, like, uh, a community radio station a couple of years ago. Because, like, uh, you know, you see, like, all these people together, and it, is, it does feel like a wonderful community of people. I'd love to work at Channel 62. You know, like, mm -hmm. uh, I think I think that would be quite quite something cool to do. And, uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, thanks to, you know, the liberalization of, like, uh, broadcasting laws and uh, licenses and things like that, I mean, there's uh, there now there's uh, across the, uh, across the, at least across the UK and uh, across uh, other places, you know, hopefully across the world, there's other Channel 62s out there, too. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I guess it would be, like, a prototype for, like, um, content that would be for a specific fan base, like... Uh, oh, uh, like the weird uh, show on Adult Swim or that obscure YouTube channel that talks about things that nobody else talks about or anything like or even a, or mu or a type of music that has been long since not popular that people are playing it. And it, it just scratches that itch of niche that um, a lot of people can really appreciate. And that niche is, you know, people who work in uh, the media industry that um, is really weird and quirky and out there. And uh, you, I think that, um, you know, for somebody like me, who is a communications major, who is going to school and surrounded by college students who want to get into the field of film and television and radio and such, it, it, it you know, being surrounded by those people doing various projects and stuff, um, it's it's amazing, and I, I it, 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 you you become like part of a family when you're involved in this group of people who have similar interests and who are doing the things that they love. So I think that um, it really exemplifies that. Mm -hmm. Okay then, well, I hope you don't mind everybody, but uh, I think we're going to leave it there, and uh, we will once again see you uh, next time for In Search of the Crystal Skull. But uh, as they say in Gandhi too, uh, I have to eat, so give me steak, medium rare. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, take care. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye for now.